about the Lord of Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, Father, we come with rejoicing. Father, it's your holy name. Father, I thank you for your gift of life. That you are the giver of life. And Lord, as we come before you today, Father, we pray that you might open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, Father, to your word. And we share with that, Father, later on. Father, speak to us, cause us to be a changed people. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Walter Clark. I'm filling in for Pastor Dave Kirby. Uh, I'd like to thank you folks for inviting my wife, Denise, and I to come and share with you today. Dave. Um, <clears throat> we're farm folks. Denise and I are both born and raised on a dairy farm. Uh, we got into sheep farming when our kids were little because we saw our kids weren't big enough to handle cows. And we've been raising sheep uh, nationally for probably about 40 years now. Uh, we've shown at Harrisburg at the farm show and at Kyle, we've shown over in Ohio, over New York State. Uh, we raise Tunis sheep. Uh, they're known as the beautiful redhead. Uh, they're actually a biblical breed. They're a fat tail sheep, and the only one indigenous to Israel with a fat tail is known as the, used for the fat tail offering for God in the book of Leviticus. So that's a little bit about us. I was called to the ministry late in life. Uh, I was licensed in 2003 in the Church of God and was ordained in 2008. I used to pastor a cowboy campus that we ran at New Beginnings. Uh, we ministered at horse shows. Uh, I still do the Crawford County Fair service. So if anybody's ever up there, on the first Sunday at the Crawford County Fair, we meet at 9 o'clock in the youth show arena. Kind of a big deal. Uh, we enjoy doing it in the barn, in the sawdust, and we do a country western style service. So if anyone's there, we invite you to come and join with us. Uh, it be a little different experience than what we have here this morning, but it's a fun time. Uh, are there any... Um, Praises or concerns that anyone would like to share here this morning? I think it's great that Velma and Ron and Wanda are here with us yes. today. Velma and Ron have some health issues going on this year. Velma's kind of had a hard go of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know what? God still answers prayer. Yes. And He still does miracles in our lives. So we give praise for that. <laughs> Anyone else? I think Lord, we're going to get ready in the next few days. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> and we need to continue to pray for that, that it doesn't go around us. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me that they got a pretty good cloud burst around the Meadville Hospital. Oh, couple days ago and we didn't get anything and we're just two to three miles away from here. So. <clears throat> Anyone else? <laughs> Let's just pray here for just a moment uh, for these requests. Dear Lord God, as we come before you today, Father, uh, I know there's many unspoken requests here before us. Father, we lift them before your throne of grace. And Father, what a privilege it is to come before your throne. Father, we want to praise you for Zelma and her recovery, Father, for the answer to prayer. Many prayers, Father, for that. <coughs> Father, we want to continue to pray for rain. And we praise you, Lord, that we see that in the forecast now. Father, we just pray that we might see that in its full fruition here shortly. Lord, Lord, I pray for the children as well. Father, I lift them before you. 
warrior trail. And Father, I know, Lord, that you love the little ones. I ask, Father, you might lead them into Jesus' arms very soon. Father, just help them to find Christ and to know the peace and the joy of your salvation. Lord, we just give you this day in Christ's precious name. Amen. Announcements?
Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would be with our leaders, both in the nation, in our state, and in our local community. Father, that you would give them your guidance, your wisdom. Father, I pray that you would supersede their thoughts, Father, cause them to do what you would desire. So that your name might be praised and glorified. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you for the leaders that we have here in the local communities, Father, who do their best to serve you. And Father, we ask for your blessing upon their lives. Father, we want to pray for uh, 
all those started, who have served our country so faithfully. The many veterans, those who gave their lives for our freedom, that we could come here, Father, and worship you for <clears throat> Father, we want to pray for our police, for our firefighters, for our EMS people, who are in service to my dream. And Father, we pray that you will be with them, not for them, guide and protect them. Father, we want to pray for today as we prepare to delve into your word. <clears throat> Lord, you would open our hearts, our minds, and our souls, Father, to your word. Father, you would cause us to be nourishment to our souls, Father. Help us to seek you in all that we do. For Father, you are the one who provides the bread. Our Father, who I can.
The scripture reading for today will be found in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. I'm going to be reading today from the New American Standard. When Denise and I got saved, and that will be another story for another time, uh, the lady and man who led us to Christ, we didn't have a Bible. We had just been married. Um, <clears throat> God had been working in our lives, and she gave us her Bible to use, and it was a New American Standard. And so we kind of grew up with that. I preach a lot of times to the New Living Testament as well. Um, but I'm going to be reading and teaching today from the New American Standard. Ephesians chapter 1, let us hear the words of our Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, <clears throat> according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, and made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, things upon the earth, and in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, excuse me, according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, you might think that that was a long passage. Uh, the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. It was one of the prison epistles, along with uh, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. They were written during Paul's first imprisonment at Rome. And... <clears throat> Although you think that's a long passage, from verses 3 through 14 in the original Greek, it was one sentence. Paul was uh, quite a theologian, and when he taught, he had long sentences that encompassed a lot of stuff. So that's why I chose to read all of that to you today. Uh, did you know that you're rich? Now, I'm not a health and wealth pastor. By any means, I'm not out there preaching, you know, you're going to get all the riches forever uh, here. But you are rich in Christ. And the book of Ephesians talks about all of our riches in Christ. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. So I like to teach and preach from it a lot. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to look at eight riches or eight blessings that you have today. Uh, you'll have a hand out there if you want to follow along and fill in the blank. Uh, I'll try and make that happen for you. <coughs> As we open up this word, um, my desire for you is to know the word of God, but even more importantly, to know the God of the word. And there is a difference. You can know a lot about the Bible and still not know God. <coughs> and know what he's like or who he's like. So as we start off, this book is addressed to the saints at the church in Ephesus. Now how many here are saints? 
<laughs> well, good, I need to preach salvation to you. You see, that word saint has uh, a misconception, and we often misconstrue it. Saint literally means set apart one. And when Paul was writing to the book, the book to the saints in Ephesians, he was talking to live people. We kind of have a misconception because we think kind of along the lines of the Catholic Church that the saint has to be somebody who is super holy, who has died, maybe some miracles have been done in their name, and then they become, quote, a saint. But Paul wasn't writing to dead people. He was writing to live people. People who had accepted Christ as their Savior. And he says, who are faithful in Jesus. Jesus had made a change in their life, and they were following him in faithfulness. Now, verses 2 and 3, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And in some versions, some of the older versions, like the King James, it says, in the heavenlies, as opposed to the earthlies. So God has given us all these heavenly blessings, but we're going to see a little bit. They're here for us now. <clears throat> So now we're going to get into the blessings. Verse 4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. What does it mean to be chosen? When I was talking with the kids here this morning, and I think many of you can think back to your school days, you know, we had teens. <clears throat> they pick you for dodgeball or softball, or uh, kickball out on the playground. And they picked two leaders, and you were thinking, oh boy, I'm going to pick. And it was always a blessing to be picked early, and not to be the last one picked, wasn't it? So to be chosen was a special blessing. And God chose us. And what's interesting, it says, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Before there was any earth, before there were any trees, before there was any grass, it says he chose you. He chose you. Now it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that, but God knew you before he created anything. <clears throat> he knew you then. He knew you when he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew you as you were growing in the womb. He knew you after you were born, and he has placed a call upon your life. So to be chosen is somebody special. You are of great worth to God. Now in verse 5, it says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. I think we sometimes get predestination mixed up. Some people look and say, well, then God predestined some to heaven and he predestined some to hell. And that is not true. Every one of us was bound for hell until we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Anytime the Bible speaks of predestination, it is always, always to salvation, always to being conformed to the image of Christ. Don't believe me on that? Go read your Bible and see for yourself if that is not true. <clears throat> and it says he predestined us to adoption. Adoption is son. Adoption is privilege. It means when we were adopted, God set out to place his love upon us. My son and daughter-in-law, we're not able to have children. You know, they prayed and prayed and they just were not blessed. So they set out to adopt. And we prayed for those children that came in and became part of our family. And we ended up having two grandsons. 
who God miraculously placed into our family, and it was a privilege. We chose to love them as our own, to make them part of our family, with all the privileges that that goes along with that. <clears throat> and that's what God has done when he predestined you to adoption of sons and daughters. He's made you part of his family by choice. He has chosen to love you, to pour out his grace upon you. <clears throat> and in fact, in verse 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. The third blessing we have is we were given grace. And it was freely bestowed upon us. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. We didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve to be a son or a daughter of God. But he chose to bestow that upon us because of his great love. In verses 7 and 8, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. <clears throat> Our fourth blessing is we've been redeemed. We've been redeemed from the slave market of sin. Now what does it mean to be redeemed? It means we've been bought back, bought back with a price, and the price was Christ's blood. You know, if something has been pawned in order to redeem it, you have to go in and pay money to get it back. God paid money, Christ's blood, to buy us back from the safe slave market of sin. And it says he, he lavished that upon us. He lavished it upon us in all wisdom and insight. <clears throat> when I think of lavishing, let me see if I can paint a, a word picture for you. Uh, a week ago, uh, we were supposed to preach at St. Mark's Church. <clears throat> and so we went to church the, the night before. Uh, we run three services in our church. And so we went to the Saturday night service. And it had been a busy day on the farm. We had been haying and everything. And you know how it is. You kind of rush through the day and uh, didn't have a chance to eat. So we said, well, I said, Denise, let's go out for supper. And uh, we went out with some friends after church, went to Perkins. And I got to thinking, wow, Perkins, it's the pancake place, right? And I thought I'd have breakfast for supper. Anyone ever had breakfast for supper? <laughs> and so I ordered a ham and cheese omelet and those buttermilk pancakes. And I love syrup. And they brought out that nice warm syrup. You know, and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to take that syrup and I pour it all over those pancakes. And you know, when I think of God lavishing his grace upon us, I think of that syrup. You know, you pour that syrup on where it's almost ready to overflow the plate. And it's so sweet and good. That's what God did for us. He has lavished his grace upon us till it's ready to overflow the plate. Because he loves us so much. He loves us so much. <clears throat> now let's look at verses 9 and 10. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things upon the earth. <laughs> Our fifth blessing is he's made known to us the mystery of his will. When the Bible speaks of a mystery, it's something that we would not normally know if God had not revealed it to us. And he's made known to us the mystery of his will. And it goes on to say there, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things upon the earth. <clears throat> now folks, we look around 
the things that are going on today. I think many of you would say, this is crazy. How did we ever come to such a time as this? The lawlessness that's going on and the perversion of justice. And we're longing for justice, for things to be made right. And God has made known to us the mystery of his will. When he says, in the fullness of time, he's saying, hey, things are going to run its course. I have a timeline. At some point, I will return, and things will be put in order. Not just in heaven, but upon earth as well. As we read through the scriptures, we see that in the fullness of time, that is going to happen. <clears throat> Things will be made right. You look at Revelation chapter 20, and it says, at the right time, there will be the great white throne judgment. And it says, all the dead will be raised to life. People under the sea, people under the earth, the great, the small, the wicked, the just. And he says, and the books will be opened. And it'll be the books of our life. And everything you thought, everything you said, everything you've done is going to be laid out. Read Revelation 20, see if I'm not right. But, for those that know Jesus, it says another book is open. And it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, declared innocent. Why? Because of Christ's blood shed for you. If you pick something that can <coughs> There will be justice. <clears throat> in verse 11, it says, And in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. So our sixth blessing is we have an inheritance. <clears throat> now you know as a child, if your parent dies and you have an inheritance, you don't get it right away. It's placed in a trust, yeah. right? Until you become age 18 or 21, whatever is decided. <clears throat> but we have been adopted as adults, as adult children, not as little children. So all these blessings are available to us, not at some point in the future, but right now. We don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. We can appropriate those blessings right now. And in verse 12 it says, To the end that we who were first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. The seventh blessing we have is a hope in Christ. We have a hope. Not, well, maybe it might happen. We have an assurance that it will happen. When he says he will return, he will return. When it says we will meet him in the air, we will meet him in the air. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed most cemeteries, most cemeteries, not all, but most, are laid out so the graves are facing east. Have you ever wondered why that is? So that when Christ returns, it says he will come from the east to the west. So when we rise up out of the ground, we will rise up facing him. We will rise up facing him. We have a hope in Christ. Number eight, verses 13 and 14. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who was given as a pledge, or the King James says, given as an earnest of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. <coughs> our eighth blessing is you were sealed 
with the Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk wow. about that sealing for a moment. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit who was given by God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the King of the universe. Whenever a king seals something, it's a finished transaction. It's a finished transaction. It signifies ownership. It signifies ownership. You are owned by the king. So if you're owned by the king, it means there's security. You have security knowing that you belong to Christ. It also means protection. God will protect his possessions. He's the king. He's not going to let anything happen to you, but what he won't be able to present you blameless before the throne. And it means authenticity. Like a seal on a document. You know, when you have a document sealed, it means it's authentic. It's the real deal. It's not a copy. It's not a fake. It's the real deal. So God has sealed you. He's placed his mark on you to say that you're the real deal. You belong to him. And it says it was given as a pledge. Or in the King James it says given as an earnest. Now that's an interesting choice of words. <clears throat> When you think back to a real estate transaction, the real estate agent will often say, hey, we need to put down earnest money, right? Why is that? Why do you put down earnest money? It's a guarantee that you are going to complete the purchase and give the rest of the money for what you owe, right? When the Holy Spirit has been given it as an earnest, it's a guarantee that God will come back and claim you for his own when that time is right. It also says to be interpreted as a pledge. And when I think of a pledge, I think of an engagement ring. Okay? When a man falls in love with a woman, what does he do? He takes a ring usually with a diamond, something precious, and he gives it to his wife to be. It's a pledge. It's a promise that on the day of that wedding, I am going to show up and claim her for myself. And that's what God has done with the Holy Spirit. He's given the Holy Spirit to you as a pledge. How many times in Scripture does it talk about us as the church be the bride of Christ. Right? If we're the bride of Christ, we want to guarantee that what he said is true. He is going to come back and claim us for his own. It's a pledge. It's a promise. And there are multiple passages in Scripture that talks about the bride of Christ. You know, in the Jewish tradition, <clears throat> When a man was married to a woman, it would happen right then. But he didn't take her as his own yet. He went back and he prepared a place. Okay, he would prepare, prepare a home for them. And then at some point in the future, he would come and say, hey, come. It's now time to consummate our marriage. And he would take her. That's what's happened with God. Remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, a mansion. What? Then he will come and call us back to himself. I often use that analogy when I'm doing a funeral because when somebody's called home, I have to remind people, God's got the man to finish, and he's calling them home. He's calling them home. So we can look forward to that. That's a pledge 
that is of promise, that is of earnest. And all these riches are given to us, and they come to us because of God's amazing grace. And what's it say at the end of that verse? It's all for his glory. He doesn't do all these things because he pities us. He doesn't do these things uh, because he wants them to rescue us from eternal judgment, although he does. <clears throat> but it's rather so that his name might be glorified. You know, there's the Westminster First Catechism. You know, what's the chief aim of man? To glorify God. To glorify God. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was writing about here. He says, all for his glory. We don't deserve these spiritual riches. We can't earn these spiritual riches. You know, we can't pay for them. We can't do this good work or that good work. Rather, we receive them by grace. God's gift to us. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, so that no man should boast. We can't brag about it. He gave it to us for free. Oh, but the cost was so great. The cost was Christ's very life. Have you appropriated your spiritual riches today? Are you a saint of God? I hope so. Let us close here with hymn 337. Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
Lord, who are with us and before us this day. Help us to continue to thank and praise you. For you are the God of all creation. In Jesus' name, amen.